Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Raypack Lonox Swimming Pool Digital Heater Troubleshooting Webinar. I'm going to take about an hour to talk about some of the problems that can occur with this gas burning appliance, how to recognize them, and what to do about them. My name is Brad Duncan. I am a product specialist and trainer with Raypack. Now, as a reminder to all our participants, the instruction provided in this training is intended for qualified and experienced professionals. If you're not qualified, please do not attempt to apply these instructions on your own. We'd like to take a moment to state Raypack's commitment to developing and producing sustainable products. Raypack and our parent company, Ream, have established firm goals as we work towards substantial reductions in waste, uh, both in our manufacturing processes and in our entire line of products. As we work toward our vision of designing for zero waste, we've developed a strategic framework with specific target goals to be met by 2025. We're committed to developing and innovating intelligent products that reduce waste over the lifetime of the appliance, including the use of recycled and recyclable materials. We will endeavor to reduce greenhouse gas by 50% and achieve zero waste to landfill in our global manufacturing operations. We will train a quarter of a million plumbers, contractors, and technicians on sustainable products, installation, and recycling best practices. So now why does this matter to you? Because your customers want to buy products from a company that values sustainability. 84% of customers indicate that they prioritize purchasing purchasing a pool heater from a brand that's committed to sustainability over one that is not. So what can you do? You can let your customers know that environmental factors are important to you in your business dealings. Purchase products and materials from companies that take sustainability seriously. Consider investing in fuel efficient work vehicles. Use paperless billing practices. Make sure the appliances you replace are properly recycled and not just thrown into a landfill. There are dozens of ways to embrace sustainability in your business, many of which help profitability. We hope you'll take the time to consider them. This is our Raypack digital swimming pool here. This is the low NOx model. A low NOx devices use a fan induced combustion, thereby reducing emissions of nitrogen oxides. Local and state codes in California, Texas, and Utah require these appliances. A properly installed and maintained, this heater will provide your customer with many years of reliable performance. Now, if you're accustomed to working on the atmospheric models, uh, because that's what you use in your area, you will find that these are very similar. They operate in a very similar way. The layout is very similar. The additional addition of a combustion air fan is the difference between this model and the atmospheric model. The Raypack Digital is available in four sizes to accommodate nearly any residential or small commercial pool. The low knock sizes mirror the sizes available in the atmospheric model. The BTU is input is the same. Uh, you'll notice that the model sizes end in a seven instead of a six. Here's what the low knocks looks like with the door off. Most of you have probably seen this a few times by now. We're going to run through it pretty quick just to uh, get, keep you up to date here. Again, combustible flooring certification, junction box top right that contains our transformer. Uh, the, uh, this particular model, the low knocks model, pulls six amps at 120 and three amps at 240. Uh, that's a little more than the atmospheric model, which is four and two. Pulls just a little bit more amperage because of the fan, all right? Again, identical junction box on the left. In case you need to pull the conduit up on the left, you can just relocate the transformer over there. Here's a fan relay that's also included inside that. Pilot assembly in the center on this model, top center instead of lower right. Air pressure switch acts as a proving switch for the fan so that the heater knows that the fan is running properly. A rollout sensor over here to the left side. Uh, that is a resettable rollout. Here's our fan that pulls combustion air in from a vent on the right and forces it into this plenum. Uh, also contained within the plenum is our manifold, the gas manifold. So those two things should open at the same time and force those two elements of fuel into the burners where they mix and ignite. A flame viewport is down in the bottom center so that we can check to make sure the pilot is lit. 
Uh, this heater is equipped with a microprocessor PC board, which will evaluate the heater functions. So you'll start with the display when troubleshooting the heater. When there's a problem, the heater will shut down and display a message indicating where the problem is. Now, this message will be spelled out in easy to understand language. There are no codes to look up. Now first, let's take a look at the board so we're familiar with the outlay and where everything plugs in. This is our printed circuit board. I am, uh, I'm going to go left to right here and then I'm going to go back up to the top and go left to right again. So uh, first thing you need to know is that breaking off tabs will make a physical change to the circuitry on the other side of the board so that the board will behave differently for different applications. So now the board itself is made to be used across a variety of heaters. It may therefore need to be modified by breaking off tabs. So the board is the same on the low NOx model and the atmospheric model. The difference on the low NOx model is you'll have to break off a tab. Now, the tabs are already there when you, when you get the heater. This would only apply for when you're uh, replacing a, uh, a board. They'll come from the factory in the, you know, in the heater already arranged, so you know, with the proper tab broken off. So you'd break those tabs off with a needle nose pliers. Now, this is a permanent modification. Choose carefully. Okay. The tab at the top is for the low NOx version. That's located next to that spade connector for the air proving switch, it says low NOx right on it. In the bottom right hand corner, you will find the tab for the propane model. When this tab is removed, the heater must fully ignite within 90 seconds or it will shut down and must be manually restarted. The tab on the right-hand side lower corner does the same thing, but it requires full ignition within 15 seconds instead of 90. We call that the New York City tab because New York requires that 15 second ignition. All right. Now, if you break the wrong tab, don't throw the board away. It's not worthless. These things are not inexpensive. It's just perhaps not appropriate for your current installation. So let's look to see where all the connectors go. I'm going to start again at the bottom left and go to the right, and then we'll go up to the top and go left to right again. So 24 volts AC from the transformer lands on the board at P6. From there, the power passes through a 5-amp fuse that protects the board. This is a standard automotive fuse. Easily removed with a thumb and forefinger, easy to find at an auto parts store. Next to that is P8, where we find our dedicated remote circuit. That blue wire is your hot, that goes hot as soon as you turn the board on. The three wire temperature sensor plugs in at P1, and the touchpad attaches next to that at P5. Now, P1 and P5 have very different pins than the rest of the board. No two wiring harnesses have the same configuration. Now, this is to make miswiring very difficult. Moving to the top right, these are our safeties. If you'll see, uh, you can just make out where it says PRS, HL1, HL2. Well, that's exactly what it sounds like, a pressure switch, high limit one, high limit two. Any open circuit disables the heater, and the display tells you which circuit is open. So these are our safeties. We'll start with those. Uh, each pair of pins, let me back up just a second. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Each pair of pins, one, two, that's a pair. That's our pressure switch. Here's a pair for the high limit. Here's a pair for high limit two. Each pair is simply 24 volts out and 24 volts back. So for the pressure switch, 24 volts out and back. High limits, 24 volts out and back. That's all that's happening. The board is just looking to make sure that that circuit is closed. Any open circuit disables the heater. Uh, the next pair of pins simply, uh, there's a wire there that, that just rolls back on itself, loops back just to complete the circuit. There's three positions on the board that do that. I'm going to show you those later. All right. The next one that's uh, completed from the factory is our rollout sensor. 
the Lonox model has a resettable rollout. At any rate, 24 volts out, 24 volts back, okay? And the last two, again, just uh, loop back on themselves. The pilot assembly plugs into this black knob right here. All right, that is a 24,000 volt coil. This is where we get our spark for ignition. Four wires go to the gas valve from P4. So there's our ground. PVMV, that's our uh, that's our our uh, neutral wire, just for the gas valve. PV is pilot valve, MV is main valve. Finally, there is uh, we're talking about low NOx today, so the proving wire from the air switch attaches here at this spade connector, the one that says low NOx right on it. Now we use a step down transformer to put 24 volts on the board. Now we're going to take that 24 volts and send it through a step up transformer to bring that voltage up to 120. That 120 is sent to the coil to produce 24,000 volts for our pilot assembly spark. Okay, the issues you see most often are going to be the safety switches. There are four installed from the factory. I showed them to you just a second ago. Okay, there are available circuits for three more. Any open safety circuit disables the heater, and the display tells you which circuit is open. Water switch open, for instance. This is your pressure switch. Now, this is probably not a heater issue, but rather an issue in the system that's reducing the flow of water. For instance, if your variable speed pump is not turning at a sufficient speed, it won't move enough water to fire the heater. So you're looking for a loss of flow coming into the heater. Check anything that could cause that. If you have an external bypass, you might need to close it up some to reduce the bypass flow and send some more water to the heater. The number one reason for water switch open is a dirty filter. A pressure switch is, in, is increased, flow is reduced. If the filter pressure is too low, something is stopping flow from getting to the filter, maybe a clogged skimmer basket or a clogged pump basket, if there's no pressure at all, that could mean a pump problem like a clogged or damaged impeller. This pressure switch must be closed to fire the heater. If you mean to test it, do so with the pump running and the wires disconnected. Pump has to be running to generate pressure and the wire should be disconnected so that you're not also checking continuity back to the board. You know, if you're checking voltage, it's perfectly appropriate to cheat those connectors back and get your leads in behind them. That would be fine checking voltage, but we're not checking voltage. We're checking continuity here. And if you do that checking continuity, you're checking continuity anywhere on that line, which means the switch itself or all the way back to the board. So we don't want to do that. Disconnect the wires when checking for continuity. Sometimes dirt or DE can lodge inside the stem to the pressure switch. Uh, you can clean that out with a drill bit. After you've eliminated everything else and the switch still won't close, then it's time to replace it. Now, it's important to understand that we're not just swapping parts here. You must identify the cause of the problem. In the case of a pressure switch, it's most likely the problem lies outside the heater and the switch has not failed at all. It's just doing its job, which is to disable the heater when water flow is not present. High limit fault, high limit one fault, high limit two fault. When the water temperature inside the header is too high, the high limit switches will shut the heater down. And they open the circuit at 135 or 160 Fahrenheit. I'll talk more about those two, laters, uh, those two numbers later for now. We need to find out where the flow problem is. 
to do that, I have to show you how the water flow works. So here we have a nine tube heat exchanger. We want to keep the water inside the tubes above 100 degrees to prevent condensation on the outside of the tubes. We want to keep the water below 135 to minimize scale formation on the inside of the tubes. Okay, we have a two pass water flow. Water flows in through the front five tubes and turns around at the other end, comes back through the last four tubes. Okay, our unitherm governor is what's going to adjust the water flow to maintain the temperatures between 105 and 125. So here's the water coming into the uh, header. Pressure begins to build inside that header and pushes against our internal bypass, which acts upon a spring, opens that valve up a little bit, and allows some of the water to turn around, go right back to the pool. Okay. Uh, in fact, before the heater fires, all but a very small amount of the water is just turning around, going right back to the pool. So the water is almost static inside the uh, heat exchanger at that point. So the water travels again in through the front five, turns around at the other end, comes back through the back four, and runs into the unitherm governor. Again, at that point, the unitherm governor is closed. So the water is almost completely static inside the heat exchanger at that point. As the uh, water begins to heat up when the heater fires, as it approaches 105 degrees, this unitherm governor will open up and allow that water to flow through, gathering with the bypass water and flowing back to the pool, All right? So when the high limits are engaged, it's because the water has gathered too much heat from staying in the tubes too long. Usually the pressure switch will shut the heater down if there's not enough flow coming in, but there could be a soft spot where there's just enough water to close that pressure switch, but not quite enough to take the heat out of the heat exchanger tubes. So first, make sure you have enough water flow coming in. Most likely, there's too much water bypassing the heat exchanger. This could be from a damaged or stuck internal bypass or unitherm governor. You'll need to remove and inspect those, particularly the bypass. If the bypass breaks or gets stuck open because the spring is corroded or the, uh, the shaft itself on the bypass assembly has corroded, that will cause it to stay open too far or open all the time and just too much water going around it and not enough going through the heat exchanger. One other possibility is that calcium scale has built up on the inside of the tubes, which reduces the flow. Reduced flow means the water spends more time in the heat exchanger gathering heat. If you catch it in time before the tubes warp, you can drill out the calcium scale using our deliming kit. So on the, the uh, residential header, both high limits one and two are located on the in-out header. On the old ASME header, high limit two is located on the in-out header. High limit one is located on the return side header. On the new ASME heater, both high limits are on the front header. Let's talk about those two numbers, 135 and 160. On the polymer header and on the previous ASME model, both high limits trip at 135. On the new ASME, high limit two is still 135, but high limit one is 160. Okay, you can see that high limit one is located closer to where the, in this case, where the tube bundle would be. So that's where the water comes in contact first. It's going to be a little bit warmer there. So we need a higher, uh, a higher trip limit on that high limit switch. The early models, by the way, had a manually reset switch for high limit one. Uh, you'll notice that little red button there in the middle of it. Those have been eliminated. The current ASME models have auto reset switches for both high limit one and two.
On the Capron header, the Unitherm governor can be removed by turning the threaded cap counterclockwise. You would place a screwdriver sideways across the notches. On the earlier ASME, you'll need to remove this brass plug. Behind the plug, there is a spring that holds the UG in place. Removing the bypass on the Capron header requires removing the header from the tube assembly attached by 12 nuts. So you can see the uh, holes there where the, uh, where the header goes onto the stud bolts and then the, the, uh, the nuts are uh, in on top of that. Remove the nuts, pull the whole assembly off, and now you can remove the header baffle, the header dam, and then you can reach in with two fingers and just pull that bypass out toward you to remove it. Now bear in mind that there's nothing holding these things in but friction. There's no sealant, there's no screws or anything like that. These can all be removed by hand without uh, taking anything else out. On the previous generation ASME, you'll need to separate the heater from the plumbing but the header will remain intact. You don't have to disassemble the header, but you do have to separate the heater from the plumbing. Hopefully the installer will have put uh, unions on that to make that easier for you. And if you're the installer, hopefully you used unions to make it easier for the next guy. I always tried to make things easier for the next guy because I knew that I might be the next guy. So you'll remove the flange from the outlet port then you can unscrew that holding rod from the outside and pull that out. Now you can reach in through that exit port and pull out the valve and the spring. This is the new ASME Unitherm Governor slash bypass assembly. It's one part now. It's held in place with bolts on the side of the header for easy removal and replacement. This means it is no longer necessary to disconnect the plumbing to change out the flow regulating parts. The bypass and unitherm governor are now one part. Two bolts fasten the UG bypass assembly to the header. Once the mounting bolts are removed, you give it a turn on the outer flange there, that helps with separation, and then you can just pull it right out. Rollout switch open. This means flame is coming out the front instead of upward through the heat exchanger. This is fire where it should not be. The rollout sensor shuts the heater down for safety. There could be something blocking the upward path of the heat, which in most cases means soot. Uh, there might also be a venting problem or certain wind conditions that can cause this. The Lonox model has a resettable rollout switch. So now why is it rolling out? Uh, maybe you have a blocked or sooted heat exchanger. The heat of the fire travels upward through the heat exchanger and passes around the tubes. If the path of the heat is blocked, it has to go somewhere else and the only other place it can go is out the front. So primarily, you're looking for a blocked or sooted heat exchanger. This would be one example of a blocked heat exchanger. Okay, this took years to ac uh, accumulate this much uh, debris that simply needed to be cleaned out. Usually the blockage is caused by accumulated soot. If the exchanger is sooted, you'll have to remove the exchanger from the heater and clean it by spraying it off with a water hose. Resist the urge to use a wire brush, okay? That soot is unburnt fuel, okay? So if you use a wire brush and you aerate that fuel in static electricity between the wire brush and that uh, copper heat exchanger, you know, you get a little spark from that. You could ignite that and, uh, well, you burn your eyebrows off. I'm fond of my eyebrows. I'm going to try to keep them. You're going to want to use water to hose that off. So now after cleaning off the soot, you'll need to determine why it sooted up. 
improper gas pressures could cause this, as could insufficient combustion air. Here's your proper gas pressures. You'll take the static and dynamic pressures on the inlet side and the manifold pressure on the outlet side of the gas valve. Insufficient available combustion air causes the heater to burn too rich. This creates soot. Have to have sufficient combustion air for that fire. This heater has to breathe. Check your venting. Is it the right size? If it's too small, the flue gases will bottleneck and slow the hot air down and cause rollout. Avoid excessive elbows in your venting. Check for crushed pipe or other obstructions. Uh, elbows like this at stair step pattern, you'll sometimes find in an older building where you know, every subsequent installer of a new heater has uh, simply tied the venting on where he found it most convenient. This is lazy venting, all right? This is something that would need to be corrected. And finally, high wind conditions can cause rollout. Here's how that works. You've got a heater parked next to a, a building or a wall. You've got a high wind event happening. Those winds bounce off that wall and then travel downward through the top of the heater and out the front, pushing the flame out with it. We can fix that. We can fix that by installing an indoor stack kit. The indoor stack kit comprises a draft hood and the ancillary products necessary to install it. They come in sizes, four different sizes that uh, correspond with the sizes of the heater, all right? This looks very similar to an indoor stack kit. It is not the same. This one's taller, it's painted for outdoor use, and that cone is designed differently than the indoor stack kit. Indoor stack kit is designed to pull air in from underneath and release it out the top. This one's backwards. It's designed to take air in the top and let it out underneath. Here's why. We still have wind, can't do anything about the wind, all right, so now we've installed this vent hood. That wind bouncing off the wall comes in through the top of that stack and out the bottom of the stack instead of the bottom of the heater. So we now no longer have rollout. Looks like this. Clock slash fireman switch. A fireman switch is a mechanical device that disables the heater before the pump turns off to allow the heat exchanger to cool down. Now, this display message usually means that you're within 15 minutes of the pump shutting down. We do strongly suggest the use of a fireman switch. So this would be a function of the switch itself and not the board. The heater is telling you at this point that it's not firing because the switch is engaged or actually, depending on how you look at it, you could say that it's disengaged. The fire switch is the circuit labeled CLK. This is one of the three circuits I was talking about that have a, a wire looping back to the board to complete the circuit. So install a fireman switch, you'll splice onto those wires and extend them out to the timer clock. And this is the most common type. You probably recognize this right away as an Intermatic T-Series. You can buy this with the fireman switch already installed, or you can buy the fireman switch separately and install it yourself. A fairly easy job of installation on that. I would point out that automation systems perform this, this function electronically, and they're not wired to the board in this way. On an electronic uh, automation system, uh, it's more of a virtual fireman switch. So they will, the, the system will make the determination as to when the heater should be turned off. Vent slash field switch one. In rooms with forced air ventilation, the heater should not fire if the fan is not running. And by fan in this case, of course, this heater has a fan on it. I'm talking about the fan that's pulling air into the room, okay? These ventilation fans will have a proving switch on them and that switch wires to the heater board. So at VNT, on the board, you would cut that orange looped wire 
and splice in an extension to the proving switch on the fan. Flow slash field switch two. This is for your flow switch. Your flow switch in this case is open. So where a flow switch is installed, this means that water flow has been restricted or otherwise reduced to the point at which the flow switch does not engage. So a flow switch goes on at uh, the loop that's the white wire that says VNT. Okay, you would cut into that loop and extend that out to the flow switch. Flow switch is in the upper right hand corner here. That's a Raypack flow switch. All right, so if you get this message, you're looking for a flow problem. This is just like with a pressure switch issue. So, dirty filter, clogged baskets, pump failure, external bypass open, uh, to open too much. And obviously, it's going to be open some. Or uh, perhaps your VSP, your pump, might be set to uh, an insufficient speed. Let's look at some error messages other than safety circuits. Remote error. No mystery here. The remoter automation system was incorrectly wired to the heater. Remember, the board wires to the automation system using the blue wire for the hot and one of the other two wires to complete the circuit. Orange for spa, black for pool. Use whichever one you like, but use only one. Otherwise, you're putting 24 volts back to the board on both circuits at the same time. The board recognizes that as an error. Exit remote mode to adjust temp. When you put this heater in remote mode, the touchpad is disabled. You can't make changes at the heater. If you try, the display will politely remind you of this. Low voltage. This indicates that there's less than 20, vo 20 volts to the PC board. This board has a built-in uh, voltmeter, and it knows what the voltage is landing on the board. So at that point, you would want to check the power at the transformer. I tell people to check the power coming into the transformer first. Uh, if I, I'm not, I've never seen a transformer fail in this way so that you have the correct voltage coming in and the incorrect voltage going out. Now, I've burned a couple of transformers in my day, but at that point, the transformer fails outright and you have obviously no message to the board whatsoever because there's no voltage going to the board. So when they fail, it's usually because you don't have enough power coming in. All right, check the voltage on the incoming side. Internal fault indicates a failure at the startup test of internal communications and processor functions. When you turn the heater on at the switch, as the board powers up, it will conduct a self-diagnostic. If during that test it finds a problem, it will show you internal fault. Now, you can try cycling the power off and on to see if it clears, but most likely that's just a bad board and you would need to replace it. Similarly, EE prom fault means the board can't remember what's been programmed, things like the temperature settings or what mode it's supposed to be in. Again, probably a bad board. Let's talk about this temp sensor for a second. This is a dual thermistor temp sensor accurate to within one half degree Fahrenheit. This is a 100K ohm sensor. That's 100,000 ohms at 77 degrees. The board will read the average of the two sensors to determine the temperature of the water and whether or not there is a call for heat. So if you see sensor failure, well, that means the sensor failed. That's... We don't know how to make it any easier than that, okay? A temperature reading of more than two degrees difference exists between the two sensors. It's a bad sensor. You replace the sensor. You might also see sensor open, which indicates a cut or broken wire, or sensor short, which means that there is a bare wire shorting out somewhere. It's all the same. Replace the sensor. If you see the word sensor, replace the sensor. 
low temp lockout. This means the water temperature is below 36 degrees and the heater is disabled. Okay, the heater knows that by the time you get from 36 to 105, that it's going to be raining inside the heater at that point. The tremendous amount of condensation for a long period of time, and that can damage the heater. Okay, this, by the way, will automatically reset with a rise in temperature. When the water temperature is up above 36, it will reset. All right, the fix is to preheat the pool. Okay, you would adjust the set point to somewhere between 50 and 70, the lowest point at which condensation does not occur. And we don't know what that number is going to be on that day in your location on that heater with that humidity. All right, we don't know what that's going to be, generally somewhere in the 50 to 70 range. What we're doing is we're preheating the pool to a, a, a temperature that's high enough so that condensation is not an issue, but not all the way up, you know, fully, uh, fully heating the pool at that point. So then you can heat from there upwards as need be. Now, we're looking at the low NOx today. So we're going to look at some things that happen only on the low NOx heater. This is why we broke off that low NOx tab to tell the board that it is a low NOx heater and certain things will apply. So one of those is low NOx tab fault. This means you forgot to break the low NOx tab off at the board. Okay. The tab was not broken and it detects power. So you've got the uh, proving switch plugged in, but the tab's not broken off. Okay, heater's not going to work when you do that. Again, here's the tab up in the top center. That tab has to be broken off. And this uh, is a white wire with a purple stripe on it that needs to be plugged on, plugged into the board. That's our proving wire. Fan five minute delay. This means your air switch was not closed within 20 seconds of supplying main valve voltage. The control will provide a five minute soft lockout and then restart at uh, pilot ignition. Now we're gonna give you 20 seconds. Essentially, what you might notice is that there is a purple wire with a white stripe on it that goes to the main valve, from the board to the main valve. There is an identical wire that goes to one side of the proving switch. Same wire, same voltage at the same time. This means that that voltage should turn around and go back once that switch closes, turn around and go back to the board within 20 seconds. Typically, it's not going to take anywhere near 20 seconds. Quite often, it happens almost immediately, all right, as soon as the thing fires up, as soon as there's pilot rectification. We're giving you 20 seconds. Uh, so that you'll have time to do a little troubleshooting to find out what's going on if there's an issue. Now, it'll do that three times. After three times, you'll see fan lockout, okay? So three lockouts occurred in one heat demand. The control goes into a hard lockout that says fan lockout. At that point, the power has to be removed and reapplied to reset it. So it's not just going to keep going forever. It's going to stop, lock the heater down, and wait for you to come out there and take a look at it and see what's going on. So possible causes for this. Your air switch may have failed. That's the proving switch. If it's not closing properly, you could have a disconnected tube. I'm going to show you that in just a minute to show you what could possibly happen there. Your fan motor may have failed. So the fan's not turning. Uh, you you could have a blocked air intake. There's a vent on the side, the right hand side of the heater down low near the front. If anything's blocking that, you won't get enough air to close the switch. Your fan relay may have failed, so you're not getting power to the fan. Or you could have the incorrect power supply. If you're running, uh, you know, if you've hooked this thing up to a three phase system, and you're only getting 208 volts coming in and you've wired it for 240, that may not turn the fan fast enough. All right. So here we are with the door off again. There's your fan. This is the air switch tube. This is the first thing I'm going to look at. Uh, sometimes you'll see some degradation near the ends of the tube. You can cut those ends off and reinsert them onto the fitting and that may take care of your problem. 
Uh, you'll need a, a tie wrap, a zip tie to hold that in place. Here's your air pressure switch. Okay, here's another look at it. Now again, remember I said there's a, oh, I, I'm sorry, I said earlier there was a uh, purple wire with a white stripe. It's actually a purple wire with a black stripe. Okay, that's your incoming 24 volts. That's the same wire that goes down to the main valve. Okay, and same the same 24 volts at the same time. That white wire just underneath it, that is our proving wire that goes back to the board once the switch has closed. And that's the wire that you're attaching to the board at the tab labeled low NOx. Flame without call for heat. This means a pilot flame was detected with no heat demand. That control will remain locked out until the situation is not present. You could have a stuck pilot valve on the gas valve. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is take a look down there and see if the uh, pilot is lit. This is why you have that viewport just underneath the plenum on the burner tray. That's so that you can check and see if the pilot is lit. If the pilot is lit, but there's no call for heat, you probably have a stuck gas valve. You can tap on that gas valve with a screwdriver handle and see if that uh, causes it to, you know, loosens it up, gets, gets it to close. Uh, that should make it uh, go out. I would consider at that point, if it happens on a regular basis, I would certainly consider replacing that gas valve. You could also have a pilot assembly making just a little bit of contact with a burner and thereby fooling the board into thinking that there's a pilot down there. But if you look through that viewport and there is no flame, there's no pilot flame, but the board says there is, I'm going to replace the board, okay? Probably a bad board at that point. PV output fault or MV output fault. Power where there should be, should not be, or no power where there should be on the valve, okay? Uh, power detected at the valve when not commanded or no power detected when it is, okay? All outputs will shut off for a soft lockout for an hour. It's gonna stop, wait an hour and try again. At the end of that hour, if this condition is not present, the heater will fire up and run just fine, all right? Otherwise, it'll go right back down for another hour and check again at the end of that hour and back down and back up and back down. And it will do that until the end of time or until the problem is corrected. So, could be 24 volts wired directly to the gas valve. I took that right out of the, uh, right out of the manual. I, I don't know why you want to wire 24 volts to the gas valve directly. Please do not do that. OK, uh, or it could be that your pilot or main valve relay on the circuit board has failed open or closed. That would be a bad board. Usually the problem is going to be a bad board at this point. Now, for natural gas products, you might see a spark and then ignition failure, no pilot sensed. OK. This means that pilot rectification has not been achieved within 90 seconds of call for heat. The, once the pilot is lit, a message will be sent back to the board telling the board that the pilot is lit. So if after 90 seconds of, of sparking, the board does not receive that signal, it tells you no pilot sensed. Now the board will continue to spark on the natural gas product. It'll keep sparking, it'll keep trying, it's just letting you know it's been more than 90 seconds. We should have had some ignition by now. Possible causes for that. If I have spark, just like with my car, if I've got spark, but it the, you know, I'm not getting ignition, first thing I'm gonna look for is fuel. Okay, maybe there's just no gas getting in there. Your gas valve could be shut off. Remember, these heaters ship with the gas valve in the off position. So you'll need to turn that on when you're installing it, okay? Uh, could be an obstructed pilot, uh, defective gas valve. Your gas valve is not opening with voltage applied. 
low or fluctuating gas pressure on the property, or a flame sensing failure. Maybe the pilot is lit. You're just not getting the message back to the board because the pilot assembly is uh, damaged in some way or the gap has opened up too wide, something like that. Main ignition failure is a similar uh, similar thing there. With main ignition failure on the natural gas models, this means the pilot has rectified, but that pilot flame was not maintained in the eight second trial ignition after rectification. This will automatically restart at spark. Write this number down. That's our uh, service department number uh, for technical assistance. Uh, technical assistance is for heaters installed that have already been installed, they're in place so that they can troubleshoot a problem with you. Applications is who you will ask for uh, at, before you install the heater. You're uh, you know, anticipating maybe an issue with uh, venting or gas line or something like that. Uh, they can help you uh, suss that out. Before you call, make sure you have things like the model and serial number so they know, you know which heater you're standing in front of. Are you indoors or outdoors? Are you burning natural or propane gas? Uh, they're going to ask you at some point, depending on the problem, what the gas pressures and voltages are at various places. Be prepared to answer those questions and give actual numbers. When you say it's good, they just know you didn't check. All right? Guys, we at Raypack truly believe we make the finest pool heaters on the market, and we hope you'll agree. We're glad you took the time to be with us today. Have a good day. Be safe.